Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being with us once again on the Sunday morning. Thank you for taking time to just listen to this word. I trust that the word of God will encourage you and uplift you this morning. Before we get into the word, let us pray and let us dedicate the service to the Lord. Father, it's into your presence that we come. We thank you so much for another opportunity that we can come and sit under your word. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that is listening to this message. I pray that revelation will come to their hearts. That, Lord, that they will experience your presence even where they are watching this from. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will think through my mind. That you will speak through my lips. That the word will come forth with accuracy. That it will come forth with clarity. Lord, that as people listen to this, Father God, that the word will bring change into their lives, into my life, into all of our lives. We know that your word is the bread of life, that we cannot be sustained in our spirits if we do not have the word inside of us. And therefore, I thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that I can share the word with the people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my scripture that I want to read from today is found in Jonah chapter 1, and I'm going to just read verse 1 to verse 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amati, or Amatai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3 said, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. And that is not where God had asked him to go. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about running away from your destiny, from the call, or from the assignment that God has for your life. And so we can read here that God sends Jonah to a certain city, to Nineveh, and he decides to go to Tarsha. It says here, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. Today the title of my message is, You Can Run, But You Cannot Hide. I want to start today's message by giving you a little bit of testimony of my life, where this became so true in my life. When we lived in Cape Town, I got born again in 1994 at a local church in Somerset West called the Bay Christian Family Church. Now, I was very active at the church, and I became an elder at the church at a very young age, overseeing around about 10 to 12 life groups or cell groups, as it was known at the time, and still is known, and that by 1999, I was really very active, and I was a, a leader in the church. Pastor Chantal and I got married in the year 2000, where she also became very active in ministry. And together, we oversee or oversaw about 120 to 200 people in the church for the pastor that we were serving at the time. Now, my dad was the area pastor at the time, and I knew that God had called me from a relatively young age. He called me into full-time ministry, and I felt that calling on my life when I was in the region of about 24 years old. And I truly felt a sense of fulfillment, a sense of purpose when I used to help people, when I was able to love on people, and when I was able to minister to people. I really felt that this was a calling that really fulfilled me. And even though I was very young and I probably didn't understand the full, the full uh, context or the full enormity of the calling that I had on my life, I knew that this is something that I should be doing with my life. And so I did all the courses that the church had to offer at the time, really just to equip myself for the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter 11 or 4 verse 11 says, And he, God, himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so I knew that I needed to be equipped if I was going to step into ministry because I was going to be part of the fivefold ministry that God is talking about in Ephesians chapter 4. I had a strong conviction in my heart that I was to pastor people and to care for people. The calling that I felt on my life was so strong as, a, as you know, to be pastoring, but yet, for the record, 
I did not want to in the natural be a pastor. I've seen what it's like. I've seen what pastors do. I've seen sometimes the burdens that they have to carry. And I felt like this is not something that I want to do in the natural with my life. However, I knew that this is something that God had called me to do. And so when I stepped into ministry, eventually, it was because God had put the calling and the strong urge on my life. But then in late 2003, I got a job offer that would really double my salary. But this job would take me away from Cape Town and would bring me to Johannesburg. This position was a great position. It was a management position. It was an advancement in my career. At that time, I was working in the, in the human resources HR space and specializing in talent management and recruitment. And this position was for an international company. It was for a recruitment agency. And they offered me this management post that really would just escalate my career. My career in recruitment really started taking off. And this job opportunity was just the start of it. The company would relocate me to Joburg. They would take my fam, bring my family down here and settle me down here. And all at their expenses, all costs were to be paid. I would leave Cape Town, come up to Johannesburg in the January of 2004. And I would start working for them in the February of 2004. Now, all of this was well planned and well thought of really in the natural but never once did I take into consideration the impact that it would have on my ministry life and the calling that God had for me. In fact, if I think back now, it really brought me to a place where I, like Jonah, I ran from the call. I knew what God was doing with me in ministry, but I ran from that. And when this job opportunity came, I did not even consult God. I did not even ask God if this was in his will for my life. You know, the position that I was offered was a position where I could recruit my own staff. I could bring my own team on board. I would start up the temp desk as well as the perm desk for the company. I would source new business for the clients. I would manage a payroll. There was just so much involved and so much learning that could happen in this position. And so I was in my early 30s at that time and I really just thought about the career. What I should have done, I should have gone and consulted God and I should have gone and consulted my pastor at the time. And none of that I did. I simply packed up and I left. And I know today, you know, sitting here that yes, God does restore and He brings us back to the calling, but it does set us back and so i was so excited for this job opportunity that i've accepted it without even thinking of other aspects spiritual aspects ministry aspects of my life you know accepting this job would make would take me to a different province it would probably need me to seek out another church because obviously i'm not going to go to church in cape town while living in johannesburg but none of this was really at the forefront of my thinking. And so fast forward a couple of months later, four months later to be exact, we bought a house here in Kempton Park, which is where we still stay. Uh, my family was down here, we were settled down here, and really my career really took off. Um, I was loving what I was doing. It was a new challenge. Every day brought new challenges in terms of my career. But family, my spiritual life, Took a dive and this is where things started going wrong for me because my spiritual life was neglected you know i started hanging out with the wrong crowd i met a whole lot of new people obviously here and they weren't bad people they aren't bad people but um they weren't they weren't spiritually lifting me up or edifying me bringing me back to the place where i should be i started drinking i started smoking i started partying um, you know, and really what I did was I neglected going to church and I backslid for two years. I backslid away from God. And I remember my wife, Pastor Chantal, she 
one day went to my dad and said to my dad, you know, this son of yours don't want to go to church. And my dad said to, to her, you know what, don't force him, just pray for him. But what you do is you take your child, we had two children at the time, take your babies and you go to church and he will soon follow. And that is what he did. And that is what I did. And so eventually we did find the church here um, in Eerlandsfontein called Christian Family Church, which is really just uh, the mother church of the church where I came from in Cape Town. So we had the connections, we knew where to go, and we started attending the church in Eerlandsfontein, but very ir irregularly. I would go whenever I felt like it. You know, if the party wasn't too hectic on the, sun, on the Saturday and I could get up for church, I would go. But it wasn't a priority for me. But it became very evident that it was affecting my family. It was affecting my wife because she was born again and she knew that, you know, church is what we did. You know, living for God is what we were doing. And so she told me one day, she said to me, Donovan, this is not, you are not the guy, the man that I married, that I fell in love with. You know, you used to be a person that set the example, set the bar and lead our family spiritually and that's the life that I want to build with you and I started having this deep conviction in my spirit that I should turn my life around that I should rededicate my life to the Lord pursue his call and his purpose for my life and this is just watching my, my wife taking my two kids to, 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 to church me not wanting to go to church and I knew that you know what, I'm not, I'm not fulfilling my responsibility as a husband and as the priest of my home. Now, three years had passed and since we moved to Joburg. And in 2007, um, we became members eventually of Christian Family Church out in Irland's Fontaine. And so we were back in church, but we were not very active. And I had to, I had to go, I went a little bit more regularly, but I wasn't very active. Eventually, we started joining fellowship groups and their prayer meeting evenings. And, and I remember one night at a prayer meeting, I, was, I went to a prayer meeting and I, and I said to my wife, you know, I'll go to church, but I don't want to get involved. Um, but I remember one night going to a prayer meeting and, and the area pastor, Pastor Mario, called me before we entered into the prayer meeting. And he said to me, you know, God has got a call on your life. You are going to be a pastor one day. Now, of course, I knew this. This was just a check in my spirit, a confirmation. But I thought to myself, wow, you know, this man, Pastor Mario, doesn't know me from a bar of soap. And really, he's prophesying something that I've been having in my spirit for a very long time. And when he said that to me, it was just a reminder that, Donovan, God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't forgotten the call that he placed upon your life. And so like Jonah, even though I ran to another city, I ran from Cape Town to Johannesburg, the call was still evident in my life. I knew that God was reminding me of the assignment that he had for me. This was God saying to me, it's time to stop running. It was another six years later that together with my wife, we were invited onto full-time staff as an area pastor at Christian Family Church. Now, I was 39 years old when I finally stepped into the calling that God had for my life. And everything worked out. You know, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work out together for the good of those who love Him and who is called by His purpose. And so family, everything worked out. And me coming to Joburg wasn't a bad thing. I met wonderful people here. I became a pastor here, you know, and I had an impact on people's life. I was able to fulfill my calling. But I truly believe that me coming to Johannesburg, not consulting God, you know, it has set me back about nine years in ministry. I truly believe that my choices, if I had taken it to God, and um, if I had come down here and I'd, pursued and continued my walk with God. I'm not saying moving to Joburg was a wrong move. I'm simply saying 
that moving to Johannesburg was a move that I did without consulting God. If I had consulted him, he might have said to me, yes, I've created this opportunity, this job for you so that you can move down so that you can start ministry. That is where I want to use you. So that could very well be this, the, the plate, the, the, or rather, the, um, you know, what God could have told me at the time. The point that I'm trying to make is that when I moved down here, it was simply a natural and a fleshly decision. And so God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, but Jonah ran from God. God had an assignment for Jonah, but he ran from it. And because of his disobedience, there were other people that suffered. There were consequences on other people. My family was probably set back in their ministry, in their callings, um, because of the decisions that I made. And so Jonah, what he did, he got onto a ship to go to Tarsus instead of going to Nineveh where God has asked him to go. And on the ship, they encountered a great storm. The Bible says the Lord brought the storm and the winds and the seas were rough and it threatened the ship. So much so that the sailors on the ship started throwing cargo overboard just to lighten the ship. But then they realized that something and somebody is causing this calamity to come on them. And eventually when they found that it was Jonah, Jonah's disobedience, Jonah eventually told them, look, what you need to do in order for this ship to survive, in order for you to survive, the storm to calm down, is for you to throw me overboard. The only way that the storm was going to calm down is if you take me, Jonah, and you throw me overboard so that at the end of the day, if I die, the ship will will survive. And so the sailors did throw jo Jonah overboard and the storm and the seas did calm down and everything was fine. But Jonah thought that getting onto a ship and fleeing to another country that he could hide from God, that God wouldn't find him there. But as the account goes in the Bible, that God arranged for a huge fish to swallow Jonah and it's in the belly of this fish that the Lord arranged to swallow Jonah, that Jonah reached out to God. You see, the Lord made another way for Jonah, another opportunity the Lord gave him so that he could repent and turn from his ways, that he could obey the word of the Lord. And so the fish that swallowed Jonah wasn't there as a punishment for Jonah, but rather it was the Lord had arranged this fish as a way of escape for Jonah because it's in the belly of this fish that Jonah came to his senses and he vowed to do what the Lord wanted, wanted him to do. You know, as he felt his life draining from his body, as he was in the belly of this fish, um, that he reached out to his Savior. He reached out to the Lord and the Lord heard his cries. And so often it's in our lowest points in our lives that the Lord will reach out to us. And here's the thing. God's mercy is endless. There is no end to his love. There is no end to his compassion. All we need to reach out to do is to reach out and in our place of despair, God will hear us. Listen to what Isaiah 59 verse 1 says. It's a beautiful portion of scripture. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is, is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. You see, God is not preoccupied with everyone else's problems that he doesn't have time for you, friend. The Lord's arm is not too short. He will reach out and he will save you. He will bring you from the point of despair. And so God doesn't bring calamity upon our lives. God doesn't cause things to go wrong in our lives. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you a life and life more abundantly. But yet God does allow things to happen in our lives. You know, to, for us to go through valleys so that we can learn from those valleys and those difficult times. We can exercise our faith and we can use our faith to bring us up from the depths 
of despair. All we need to do is we need to repent. We need to return to God. You know, I think of the prodigal son right now. You know, when he was sitting in the pig's pen, eating or longing to eat the pig's food, he came to himself. The Bible says he came to himself. Sometimes we just need to come to the realization we cannot do life without God. We have to return to him. And so the, the, the prodigal son, in his instance, he returned to his father. The father represents God the father. And so we too need to repent and go back to God. When we mess up, we need to go back to God. And so what I did a couple of years earlier, when I was in Johannesburg, I just pondered upon my life and how I got here and the journey that I took. And, and God reminded me that, you know what, you never even spoke or asked the pastor's forgiveness that you just up and left. You were an elder in his church. You were serving in his church. And you just up and left. You were a leader in this church, but you just up and left. And so I wrote a letter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a letter of repentance to Pastor Allen, which I sent to his office. Now, the letter that I sent to him really was not because he had not forgiven me. I'm sure he had. I'm sure that it wasn't even something that was an issue in his life. However, I needed to write the letter of repentance to him to ask him to forgive me because I've asked God to forgive me for my sake so that I could move on. And so sin causes a separation between man and God. And to bridge that gap, we need to repent. Repentance will allow us to cross that bridge and to be reconciled back to God. And so the whole city, when Jonah eventually spoke to the children um, in Nineveh, and he told them, and he prophesied over them, and he said, your sin has angered the Lord, and within 40 days you will be destroyed. And the people of Nineveh heard the word of Jonah, and they believed the word of Jonah. They believed that God can and will do this. And the people, the whole city, turned their lives around, and they repented. In fact, the, the entire country fasted. We read the king even heard about this and he declared and decreed a fast throughout the land and he appealed to the people to turn away from their sin. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5 says, Jonah began to go into the city, going on a day's journey, and he called out, 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown and the people of Nineveh believed God and they called a fast and they put sackcloth on them for the greatest of them to the least of them. In other words, from the greatest to the least of them, they all sat in sackcloth and they all sat and repented and asked God to forgive them. The entire city turned from their wicked ways and returned back to the Lord. And God did not then bring disaster onto the city. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. When God saw what they did, when he saw their repentance and how they turned from the evil way, God relented from the disaster that he would have or would do to them. And he did not do the disaster to them. So when the people returned and repented, it activated God's grace and God's mercy. You see, God's grace and God's mercy is always available, but we need to activate it in our lives, and we need to reach out to the Lord. You know, when the people of Israel sinned against God, God's anger burnt against them, and He wanted to destroy the children of Israel. We see that Moses had to go, and Moses had to beg God not to destroy them. Moses stood in the gap for the people, and he pleaded to God on behalf of the people. In Exodus 32, verse 9 to 11, and, and then 14, and then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me, let me, excuse me, now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, 
and that I may consume them in order that I may make you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? And then verse 14, And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing over the children of Israel. You see, so even back in Moses' time, you can see that the Lord does relent from disaster if the people would turn back to God. And the people of Nineveh turned back to God and, they, and God relented from the disaster that he had spoken against them. And Jonah, instead of being happy that the people repented, Jonah got angry that the Lord showed mercy and the Lord showed grace towards the city. You see, friend, man's nature is to always to give people what they deserve. But God's nature is to give people grace, that unmerited, undeserved favor. Nothing that you and I can do to earn or deserve God's grace and mercy. That is what God wants to give man. And so Jonah wanted the wrath of God to destroy the people of Nineveh. He wanted God to give them what they deserved. But you see, friend, God is both just and merciful. You know, and as I draw to a conclusion, I'm reminded of this illustration, which I quite love, that illustrates to you how one can be just and merciful. There was this judge in the small town and he had a son and for his son's birthday he bought him a motorbike but he said to his son look you need to obey the rules of the road whenever you're out on this motorbike because if you do break any of them and you get caught you will stand in judgment before me i will i'm the judge of the town and so you'll stand before me and i'll have to proclaim judgment on you for breaking the law and as it happened that the son was caught speeding at quite a high speed that he had to not just pay a fine but he had to go to court he stood before his father which was the judge and the father looked at the charges and looked at the speed that he was caught at and the father had to pronounce the judgment and the father fined him either 10,000 rand or three months in prison and the son looked at his father and the son thought in his heart but but you my father how can you do this to me and he said to the father but dad you are my father how can you sentence me so harshly and the father then said up here I'm the judge he took down off his his, his cloak he went down stepped off the bench went down to his son that was standing in the accused bench and he gave his son the 10,000 rand and he said to his son you must understand up there I'm the judge I need to I need to make sure that judgment and justice is served but down here I'm your father here's the 10,000 rand pay for your fine and the father showed him mercy by giving him the payment and that is exactly what Jesus did for us. You see, friend, you and I deserve death. You and I deserve to go to hell. Like the children of Nineveh, like the children of Israel, we turn from God at some point in time in our lives. And so the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that God is a just God and He will not let sin go unpunished. But you see, God then made a way for us by taking His only Son, Jesus Christ, and sending him to the cross to die for your sin and for my sin. And all we need to do is we need to accept Jesus as that full payment. You see the son, when he was standing there, and he, he needed to take that 10,000 rand so that he could pay the bail. He could pay the fine rather. But if you see, if he was proud and said, no, I don't want anything to do with my father. How can he do this? How can he pronounce this judgment on me? Then he would have to spend three months in prison. 
And so to you and I, we have to soften our hearts and accept the fact that Jesus has paid the full price for us. If we don't, we will have to pay the fine ourselves. We would have to pay for our sin ourselves. And that is then where hell was created for the devil and his followers. And so hell was never created for mankind. But here's the thing, the devil wanted to take as many people along to hell with him as possible. The way to escape hell is to give your life to Jesus. But it's not only to escape hell, it's also to live an abundant life here on earth. You know, God has given us so much. He's done so much. Eternal life is the biggest price and gift that God has given us. But there's so much more to this life of Christianity, living a life for God. And today, friend, as I close the service now, I want to give you an opportunity. If you perhaps are listening to this, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an invitation. Pray this prayer after me. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and invite Him into your life. You do this by confessing and praying this prayer. Say this. Say, Father God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that you allowed your Son to go to the cross to pay for my sin. Today, today Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I repent of all my sins and ask you to forgive me. Help me to live a life that is closer to you. Thank you for accepting me into your family. Amen. A friend, if you've prayed that prayer, and you're sincere in your heart about it, and you've invited Jesus into your heart, I want to be the first to congratulate you. It's a wonderful decision. It's not, Jesus hasn't promised us an easy life. This is not going to necessarily be an easy road, but it's going to be a victorious one. You know, when you face challenges, you now know that you don't face it alone, but you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You've got Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've got the Father that's looking out for you all the time. And so I want to invite you, if ever in, if you're in the Kailami area, we're out in Barbecue Downs. Our address is 11 Candingen Avenue in Barbecue Downs, Kailami. That's in the Midrand area. Come pop in for a Sunday morning service. Every Sunday at 9 o'clock we have an in-person service. We would love to meet you. And so I pray and I trust that you're going to have a beautiful day going forward and that this message touched you today because I believe it's the heart of the Father that we cannot run from God. We can always, God will always find us where we are. He's created you and He's an omnipresent God. Well, we love you. We continue praying for you. And until we speak again, God bless you.